Well, today I'm going to be talking to you about two of my intellectual passions. Uh, and I'm going to be saying a little bit about the accidents that have occurred to me along the way. Uh, it was actually an accident which made me so interested in computer science in the first place. Uh, back in 1984, I was eking out a living as a lecturer in theology and philosophy at uh, Glasgow University uh, on a basic salary of £3,000 a year. And looking around at the complete absence of philosophy jobs because of the Thatcher cuts, so I went out and bought myself a BBC computer, using all my savings. It had 32K of memory. And uh, that was plan B. And then, by accident, Leeds University re-advertised a lectureship in computer science and philosophy that I hadn't bothered to apply to first time round. I didn't have any qualifications in computing. And I thought, well, it's worth a go. And I got it. And I spent 20 years lecturing in computer science and philosophy at Leeds. Now, I've been at Oxford for over eight years now. And recently, uh, you may know, there's a new degree in computer science and philosophy, which I uh, urged back in 2006. It takes a long time for these things to happen in Oxford, as you probably know. The old joke, how many Oxford dons does it take to change a light bulb? Change? So anyway, our, our second cohort are it's halfway through their first year now, and they're doing it well and enjoying it a lot. A cynic might say, with some reason, that uh, coming up with that degree is sort of retrospectively making sense of my life. Uh, I think there is actually quite a lot of truth in that. And something that I've encountered throughout my time doing computer science and philosophy is, isn't that a strange combination? And I think the reason people think that is summarized up there. Now, actually, I think 50% of those judgments are wrong. You can probably work out for yourself which they are. There are actually loads and loads of links between philosophy and computer science. Uh, logic, artificial intelligence, too obvious to be worth discussing. Ethics of information, privacy, security, uh, behavior. Think of robots, like that robot there, a rescue robot designed to go into uh, places which are quite perilous, mines, avalanches, etc. need to be able to make decisions. And this is going to happen more and more, that we're going to have autonomous robots in situations where they can't be controlled by a human, and we have to think through the ethics of that. We just had a talk earlier about ethical issues uh, that involve computers as well. Philosophies of aesthetics, you've got computer artworks. Mathematics, you've got computer proofs. Science and social science, I'll be saying a bit about. Think about computer models of global warming, uh, on which perhaps the future of the planet depends. How far can we trust them? That's a philosophical issue, an issue of philosophy of science or epistemology. There's philosophy of artificial intelligence, of artificial life, of computation of information. Totally new fields that have come about because of the computer. But even more fundamentally, a whole host of philosophers down the ages have dreamt about automating human reason. Essentially, that's what Aristotle was doing when he invented logic. Frege, when he took it a lot further. And lots of other philosophers have dreamt this dream. The computer actually enables it to be something close to reality. Think of the computer as something like a prosthesis for the mind. If you haven't got legs, you can attach a prosthesis and it will allow you to walk and run. Now, think about the computer as an add-on to your own mind, helping you out, doing you kinds of thinking for you that you can't do for yourself. It's more accurate. It doesn't get tired, it doesn't get drunk. It just does the same thing again and again and again. It's much faster, hugely faster. You can make new discoveries. You can use new methods. I'll be talking a bit about those. And very importantly, it's not, as they say, rocket science. Uh, most of the programs that I'll be showing you here are actually quite short. Some of them 50, 60 lines of code. None of them, I think, except one, more than 
400 lines of code. Um, so the point is you don't have to be an expert to be able to use computer science. And what I'm going to try to persuade you, pretty much all of you, almost whatever area you're in, is that being able to write programs, being able to use that adjunct to your brain, to harness all that power, to help you think, is a very valuable thing to do. And I'll be focusing particularly on the social sciences, but more widely as well. Now, I mentioned that the computer can help us discover things. One important thing it helped discover is chaos. Uh, the so-called butterfly effect. Uh, se great sensitivity to initial conditions. With a double rod pendulum, if you start it from a slightly different position, the path will be quite different. Called, known as the butterfly effect. But that was discovered by Edward Lorentz when he was running a computer simulation of the weather. And he found that if he put one constant slightly differently, everything turned out differently. Now, until the computer, although theoretically this was known about, it had almost no impact in public consciousness. Then it became big news because everybody could see it for themselves. Now I want to talk about uh, the computer as helping us to analyze problems, giving new methods of inquiry. Now, don't you think this is quite shocking? Elite universities, I've divided the population there roughly into three groups, 20% privileged, 50% middling, 30% deprived, and look at the statistics of success getting into uh, certain anonymous elite universities. <laughs> Isn't that shocking? The 20% most privileged take 41.6% of the places. The deprived barely get a third of the places they ought to get. And we've got plenty of politicians who are utterly shocked by this sort of thing and say that here in Oxford and in Cambridge, we should be taking people in proportion to their representation in the population. Well, maybe. Let's just do a little simple model to analyze what might be going on here. It's artificial, but the whole point about computers is that artificial simulation, playing thought experiments with them, can teach you all sorts of things. So, Here's a thought experiment which I hope is not uh, too biased. Let's assume that everyone has a native ability and an interest and the, in, the, in, in the subject they're going to study. And let's suppose that they are constant amongst the entire population. But let's suppose that those who are privileged have an advantage when it comes to development of their intellect, uh, knowledge of the subject, and probably ambition. That's not unreasonable, is it? Let's suppose that the middling part of the population are just 10% on those factors behind the privileged, and the deprived are another 10% behind. And let's say that native ability, let's assume we're confident in our interview methods and so on, uh, native ability counts most of all these things, 10 times more than any of the others. What would you expect the outcome to be? Well. This is the population curves that you get. The privileged averaging 1,400, the middling averaging 1,370, the deprived averaging 1,340. So I've, I've given up to 1,000 a, a for native ability and 100 for the others, maximum. Uh, sorry, uh, average. OK, so what's going to be the outcome then if selection is done purely according to this merit score? Imagine cutting off the top of the distribution. Got a million people, and we're selecting 3,000. What's the effect? That's the effect. We get those statistics we saw before. Now, that doesn't show that uh, the methods of uh, acceptance at the, this hypothetical university are entirely valid and fair. But it strongly suggests that you should not expect the distribution that we get to correspond with statistics of the population. When you have curves, even if they differ very slightly in terms of overall average or shape, if you cut off the top part of those curves, you'll get a very, very significant difference. Okay. That little program, by the way, I, with just a few hours work in an afternoon, it's not a complex program. Uh, I've 
given you the model, basically you just need to be able to put in uh, random variables with the appropriate statistics. You add them up, you produce the graph using a, a tool that's provided for you. It's actually very easy. But you can see that doing this kind of thing sheds important, potentially important new light on a very contentious question. Let's take another example. Here's a rough map of part of a city, and you can see that there's appalling racial segregation between the blues and the reds. Isn't that terrible? What a prejudiced lot they must all be. Well, again, maybe not. Let's go with another simple model. So we've got reds and blues, and most of the city will be covered by reds and blues. There will be some green spaces which are not uh, occupied. And as a red, I'm going to be content if I have slightly more blue neighbours than red neighbours. If I have three red neighbours, four blue neighbours, that's fine. But if I have only two red neighbours and four blue neighbours, no, I'm not happy. I don't want to be outnumbered to that extent. So if that happens, I'm going to up sticks and move to a green area which is okay for me. So what happens if that plays out? You can see that the initial situation is set up so that there's no segregation at all. But there are some individuals who nevertheless, because of the location of the green spaces, are unhappy. And they start moving. Again, according to this very, very simple rule. This is quite a famous model in economics, uh, invented by Schelling. This, by the way, is, uh, it's a 50 or 60 line program. It's uh, not difficult to do. And the result consistently comes out like this. So again, what it shows is that very small pressures at the local level can build up to an effect at the global level which looks very, very different indeed. And that is a very important message, and computer models help us hugely to discover that kind of thing. Well, Thomas Hobbes, a uh, famous alumnus of Hartford College, I'm proud to say, uh, in his Leviathan, uh, famously came out with a thought experiment about what man was like in the state of nature. And he came out with a solution, namely absolute monarchy or absolute sovereignty, uh, as the only way of solving that problem. Nowadays, we can do more complex thought experiments. In the tradition of Hobbes, trying to work out what form of government or social organization is appropriate, given what is going out on at the basic level of humans and their motives and their interactions, but we can do things that are far, far more complex. Uh, and as you can see, we often get surprising results. Unfortunately, economists don't share this view. Uh, traditional economics from Valras basically models itself on uh, fluid mechanics, uh, the science of the 19th century. Pure theory of economics is a science which resembles the physico-mathematical sciences in every respect. We want to do the kind of mathematics they do in those sciences. We want to look for optima, for equilibrium. How can we do that? Well, the only way we can do that is if we make certain simplifying assumptions about human behavior, that people have absolutely consistent preferences over time, unless we put them in as part of our model influenced by other factors, that people rationally optimize what they do, that they've got virtually perfect knowledge of the environment, apart, again, unless we model that as precisely known uncertainty, uh, the ability to calculate perfectly, for equilibrium to be established instantaneously across a population, and further, it, it tends to assume that you can model the behavior of large groups in terms of small numbers, even one representative agent. Now, none of those assumptions are anything like true. The big question is this, does it matter? Do economic predictions work in the large with everything averaging out, even if the assumptions at an individual level look crazy? Well, that's an open question. And a lot of work which uses agent-based models where things are done at the micro level 
and where the macro grows out of the behavior of the micro level suggests that this is very far from the case. Just one example. Suppose you believe that economic systems naturally equilibrate. They seek e equilibrium. It's like putting liquid into a load of jars and they all settle down to the same level. In which case, putting lots of connections between the jars, putting more liquidity in the system, is going to help. You'll reach equilibrium more quickly, and if it's disturbed, it'll be reached again quickly. If, on the other hand, a lot of behavior in economics is more like herding or fashion, then quite the reverse is the case. Putting in all these extra links means that if there is a noise at one part in the system, which may be quite mistaken, there may be some scare or some hope, it's going to reverberate through the rest of the system very, very quickly. And of course, with computer trading and all the rest, uh, we know what happens. Max Planck, famous quotation, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that it's familiar with it. This was applied a lot back in the 60s, 70s, when continental drift finally got accepted after having had overwhelming evidence for a long time. Uh, naturally, if people are trained within a particular paradigm, it's very tough to shift, to learn new tricks. But most of you are young enough that you can learn the new tricks. Do. New tools will open new doors to you. You can be at the forefront of 21st century developments rather than simply following in the footsteps of the 19th and 20th. It's an exciting time. It's a fantastically exciting time, actually, given what computers can now do and how cheap they are. And again, you don't need to be a genius to do it. Uh, explore, be creative, have fun. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some fun I've had uh, with my computing experiences. Somewhat strange, I have to say. I wrote some software when I was at Leeds to imitate a chatterbot. And this was designed to teach people artificial intelligence, to get them started by doing something that was fun. It got picked up by a guy in a market research outfit, and we ended up giving a joint paper, paper to the Market Research Society. Uh, you can see the kind of thing that they did with my slides. Uh, the rest was all like this. It was absolutely over the top, but quite fun. Uh, back in 2008, uh, the Republicans approached me. Uh, they'd been using uh, another bit of software I wrote, which I'd written in order to try to stimulate people in the humanities to take an interest in computing. And it was software that compared texts to try to identify authorship patterns. And they had some people who had been using this software, and they, they reckoned they could prove that uh, Obama's autobiography was written by this guy at the right, Bill Ayers, who was a former domestic terrorist. So they, they offered me $10,000 to prove it. <laughs> um, but So that was rather an... <laughs> no, no, I didn't really feel very much conflict of interest. <laughs> uh, so that got me on the front page of the Sunday Times and inside, as you see. And uh, more recently, I got on the front page of the Sunday Times indirectly through uh, this lady... Um, the Sunday Times approached me, again, with that piece of software called Signature. They wanted to establish whether J.K. Rowling had actually written The Cuckoo's Calling. And on this occasion, and this is actually quite rare, the software came out with a pretty decisive result, that out of all the authors I looked at, she was way more likely than the others, even if you compared Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, which was really quite surprising. You don't expect that to be like a crime novel, right? You don't expect it to be more like a particular crime novel than that novel is like other crime novels. So um, finally, I just want to show you very quickly, uh, this is a system for teaching programming. Uh, this is quite a big piece of software. Uh, you can see it's very easy to use. You've got the programs down the left. You can see very short program. And on the right, you can see it produces quite an exciting result. I've been using this to teach uh, children from nine years old up to 17, 18, are going into schools, encouraging them to get into programming. Uh, these programs are all built in as examples. Um, and you can do quite fun 
and even quite potentially serious things. This is a program to play noughts and crosses. I'm deliberately playing badly and it's going to beat me. It's only 116 lines of code. It's not actually that difficult. But if you learn how to do that, you can do artificial intelligence. This is a model of the iterated prisoner's dilemma. I haven't got time to explain it now. Time <laughs> but um, you'll see that basically the bad guys are losing and the, the good guys uh, are winning out in the end. Um, if you know about Robert Ax Axelrod's stuff, that's the kind of thing you can implement there. So um, I think there is one more slide to come. There we are. If you go to that website, you'll find lots of resources. They're all free. There's another program produced with the system. Uh, I hope you enjoy getting into computing. If you haven't already, many of you will be. I can say that it's made my life a lot more interesting. And uh, I think it stands to make your lives even more so. Thank you very much.